was gone from our relationship. So I tased him. I'll ask him again when he wakes up. <laughs> An automobile driver noticed that a tire was going flat, pulled over to the side of a lonely road adjacent to a tall metal fence. While replacing the tire with a spare, the apprehensive driver removed the four lug nuts and accidentally dropped them down a sewer grate. A figure behind the metal fence saw the dispirited driver and presented a clever solution to the awful predicament. Each tire could be attached with three lug nuts and the car could be driven to a service station for further assistance. The helpful person was a resident of a mental asylum. And the antidote ended with this didactic exchange. How is it that you could give me such advice? And the voice came back, I may be nuts, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> there you go. A tough old cowboy told his grandson that if he wanted to live a long life, the secret was to sprinkle a little gunpowder on his oatmeal every morning. The grandson did this religiously and lived to the ripe old age of 98. When he died, he left 16 grandchildren, 20, 29, no, 16 children, 29 grandchildren, 37 great-grandchildren, and a 15-foot hole in the wall of the crematorium. <laughs> <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> Too much gunpowder. Yeah, seriously. I was watching TV the other evening on the Christian channel, and there was a, a Bible teacher who was... Well, sort of had an air of, of uh, I can tell you uh, a lot of things because I know a lot of things. He didn't say that, but he carried that air. And um, I, I saw the little group that he was teaching, and uh, I'd seen him on there before, but never really stopped to listen to him. He was teaching about the 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 shepherd and the sheep, and he said. Uh, uh, I want to talk to you about the 99 and the 1. You know the parable that Jesus gave. It said the, the shepherd left the 90 and 9 and went to find the 1. And he said, uh, there's a misnomer about this that uh, I largely attribute to the writer of the song. The song says, Save for the 90 and 9 in the fold. Safe though the night was stormy and cold. And you, you know that and how that, uh, uh, but anyway, he said those sheep were not in the fold. They were in the wilderness. And he read the scripture. They flashed it up on the screen. And it says, and the shepherd left the sheep there in the wilderness and went to look for the one. And I thought to myself, you don't know as much as you think you know, Jack. Because although he left them in the wilderness, every shepherd who is a shepherd builds a fold wherever he's at. As a matter of fact, he, he builds it with thorns and thistles and sharp sticks and one opening. It's like a horseshoe with an opening. And he lays down in the opening and is the door, Jesus gives this example on more than one occasion. And even shepherds do not leave their sheep alone. They have under-shepherds or what Jesus called hirelings. They don't own the sheep, but they're hired by the shepherd to help watch the sheep. So this guy was, was uh, propounding to no, and, and he even started making the statement. Now these sheep, when they left these, when he left these ninety and nine sheep, they started scattering in the wilderness. And I said, No, that wasn't my shepherd that did that. That's your mind that's doing that. At any rate, 
I, uh, I got to thinking about that. I, I, I'd like to straighten him out. But then I said to myself, what gives me the right to think I can straighten anybody out? And then I got to thinking about it. I got a King James Bible, and I can read. I got 130 online translations from Gateway. I've got a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. I've got an Englishman's Hebrew Concordance. I've got a Scribner's Complete Five-Volume five Biblical Dictionary that was printed in England years and years ago. I've got a, books by E.W. Bullinger, one of the sharpest guys I've ever read after. It's his complete study of biblical numerical precision. I've got a Brown Driver and Briggs and Genesis, Geniuses, Hebrew lexicon. I got a Bauer Greek English New Testament lexicon, Art Gingrich, Greek lexicon, Art Gingrich, Greek New Testament word study, Kittles Theological Seminary, Moulton Geden Greek New Testament word study, a three bookcase library of study materials written by highly recognized, gifted, and anointed authors. I got a Zondervan Amplified Bible and New Testament, Old Testament and New Testament. Plus, I've got 67 years of relationship with the author and the revealer of the Word of God, the Holy Ghost Himself. So maybe I could straighten somebody out if the Lord told me to. But not because I know so much, but because the Holy Spirit is the administrator of truth. Now I want to say something to you, and I hope this sticks in your ears. Even painful truth can make you free. Mm -hmm. My Bible says ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. All truth doesn't make you feel good. Some of it stings. Some of it hurts. Some of it corrects you and chastises you. But even painful truth can make you free. I said all that to say this. I've got a word from God. And I'm not ashamed to say that. I would be ashamed if I didn't have a word from God. I was going to play for you this morning, but I didn't get a chance to test it out. The song that you've heard many times, Order My Steps in Your Word, Dear Lord, because... I want to talk to you today about getting your house in order. I hope Vinny came and fixed this TV during the week, and I think that he did. But I didn't have time to check it out this morning, so I couldn't play that song for you on there. So, the, But the song that we heard was, was good, and it fit right in. So I want to talk to you about getting your house in order. Now, I woke up. Hearing the voice of the Lord one day this week, I heard God say, Hezekiah, get your house in order. Hezekiah, get your house in order. I woke up with that. Didn't go to bed with that on my mind. I woke up saying it. Hezekiah, get your house in order. Now the reason God said that through the prophet Isaiah to Hezekiah was because he was dying and he needed to get his house in order. But that wasn't the tenor that the voice was giving me. It wasn't that I felt like somebody was going to die, myself or anybody else. It was that if you don't get your house in order, you will miss what I'm going to send you. That's what the Lord was saying. I looked at the clock. It was 5.55 a.m. 
It's interesting because, you know, God speaks in numbers and in uh, code. Who do you want to message? Oftentimes. 555 is three fives. Five is the number of grace. Three is the number of divine perfection. So my assumption is that three fives is the divine perfect grace of God. And grace is not just the unmerited favor of God, it's the divine enabling unmerited favor of God. So when God spoke to me at 555 that houses should be gotten in order, I began to ponder Three fives equals 15. How many years did God add to Hezekiah's life when he prayed? I know. 15. 15. That's interesting. Three fives at 555. I, I, I wasn't thinking about any of that. I wasn't thinking about anything. I just woke up and heard myself saying it. Seven plus eight also equals 15. Seven is the number of Completion and fullness. Eight is the number of resurrection and new beginning. So here again, you're getting you're getting messages, numerical messages, out of the timing and out of the the wording, and out of the illustration that is given. So I know that God was giving me a word to give you. I'm confident. got a call right after that from some friends of ours that I will not name that uh, live in another city that have a an emergency not physical but a a family emergency so we went to prayer and God began to visit so God had me awake and alert when that call came in and uh, I was able to, to minister uh, where that was concerned and have heard back that the Lord has spoken, and that's good. God has ways of doing things yes. and communicating. Mm -hmm. I want to say this to you. Where there is no law, there is no order. And where there is no order, there is anarchy. And anarchy is confusion. If you look up the definition of anarchy in the dictionary, it says that it is a lack of order, it is a confusion because of lack of government. That's interesting, isn't it? Look at the times we're living in. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 8, Jesus made a statement that he only made one time in his life on earth. It was a very important statement. It was precipitated by an incident in his life. A soldier, Roman soldier, not Jew, uh, Gentile, Roman soldier came to him who was a believer. And said, my servant is sick at home. Will you come and heal him? Jesus said yes. And starts with him to go to his house to heal his servant. On the way there, this soldier receives, a, I, I have to assume he received a spiritual vibration. He received a revelation. And he stops and says, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. Speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. And Jesus makes a statement that is really quite something. Not in all of Israel have I found 
this great faith. What did this soldier say? I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. Just speak the word. What a soldier means when he says something like that is speak the orders. Give the orders. Cut the orders. And he says, I'm a man in authority and a man under authority. I speak to those that are under me and tell them to go. They go over me. They, they give me commands and I obey so I know that you are Lord, and if you just cut the orders, bring the orders, and I'm talking to you about setting your house in order. Jesus called that great faith that this man understood that God moves in order. You see what I'm saying to you? And I woke up. The Lord said, set your house in order. I want to say that the house of the United States is out of order. It's drastically out of order. It's not your personal house, and yet it is, because you are a citizen of this country. And you have a not only a privilege to vote and be an influence, you have an obligation so. So I believe our house needs to be set in order because I think God wants to do something for us that he cannot do in chaos. When God came in the beginning, it was chaotic. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. There was no, the Bible says, the earth was void, void and without form. That's chaos. That's anarchy. God could not creatively move until he began to speak and the spirit began to move and order was created. Then God, in his genius, began to make wonderful things. God does not operate in chaos. He operates in order. And he said, get your house in order. So... I, I want you to receive this as though it's just you and me sitting here. And I'm saying this to you as God said it to me. I want you to take it that personally. Get your house in order. Not because you're going to die, but because God wants to do something. And if you are out of order, you can't receive it. Your receiver's broken. Does, does that make sense to you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. As a nation and as a an individual. Now listen. God speaks in numerical precision. I just gave you examples of that. His word is coded. It's a natural book. It's a history book. It's a science book. It's a, uh, it's, it's a, 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 a book of all kinds, but more importantly, it's a spiritual book. And everything God says has importance. And God speaks to us in ways that without discernment you're going to miss something. Because it is numerical precision that God speaks with. Now, the first law of heaven is divine order. There is nothing in heaven that is out of order. The only thing that ever got out of order in heaven was Lucifer and God promptly expelled him and one third part of the angels with him. Why? He was out of order. He became an anarchist. He wanted to take over God's position. And God promptly kicked him out and restored the order of heaven. If God did it there, he can do it here. Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. 
our Father which art in heaven, hallowed, sacred, holy, righteous is thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. That's order. The order of heaven here. That's what Adam's assignment was. It's still our assignment. God has not gone to a plan B. He keeps bringing us back to plan A. The kingdom of God is a coming. It's coming. I want to be a part of it, don't you? Amen. So the first law of heaven is divine order. Order is, this is the definition of order. Are you ready? Structure. Framework. System of operation. Ordinance of rules. Standard of arrangement. Ordained statute of procedures. Code of function. Duly constituted directives. That's what order is. And Jesus say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is. Do you think God wants your home to have the same order of heaven? Do you think God wants your nation to have the same order of heaven? Why would Jesus tell us to pray this if he didn't think it was possible and if he didn't want it to be so? See, that prayer is a mandate. It's not a suggestion. Pray for the order of heaven in the earth and in your life and in your home. Several years ago, my dad got a job at a little place by the side of the road in Greenville, South Carolina called Barbecue King. You think that's where they serve food. But it had, it had nothing to do with food. It had to do with the machines that barbecue the food. Barbecue machines. You ever been in, in a grocery store or a delicatessen or something and saw these big, what they call barbecue machines, warmers, and all with a rotisserie in there that's barbecuing hams and chickens and whatever else? Well, my dad got in pretty much on the foundation of this because the man that started it, Mr. Wilson, uh, just had some money and he just started this little company and I don't know how Dad got connected with it, but he, he, he did. And they had a, a, a crude assembly line. Uh, they would take uh, aluminum, metal, and they would take it down to what they call the cutting department and the uh, uh, fabrication department, and they cut it and bend it and shape it and, and form it, and then uh, they'd send it up to the shop where the assembly line was, where they would, uh, people on the assembly line with, with tables and that machine would go down. It wasn't on a conveyor belt. They just, on this station they did something, and then they moved it on to the next station. It, it, it was just a, a rinky-dink operation. And uh, they had drills and, and, and metal cutters and all that. And they'd make these machines, and then they, they would wire them up and uh, send them on down the line, put glass doors on them and everything. And, and uh, it was just, they made barbecue machines. Well, the company grew and, and this and that and the other. And so there came a place where my dad was given the assignment of of doing all of the wiring on these machines. And, and they chose the right guy because my dad was very good at stuff like that. My dad was in order. He knew about order. And uh, so they built him a, a little room in the middle of the plant and uh, that room was called the wiring room. 
Some called it the chicken's nest because daddy went in there and put up chicken wire all around the perimeter of this room because what he would do is he would take the panels on these barbecue machines where all the controls were and he would code the wires with colors, with stripes, with red, yellow, black, white, and in and, and, and different color stripes. He would uh, solder the wires to the switches and sometimes he would put little connectors on the ends where you could screw uh, the thing and he he, it was, he called it a wiring harness. And all of these wires looked like a, a, a knotted uh, octopus. Daddy understood every bit of it. He pre-cut the wires. He put the endings on the wires. He, he co coded them and numbered them and everything he had. And he'd take those panels and hang it up on that chicken wire when it was done. Now, they made different kinds of machines as the company did. Developed. There were different kinds of machines, different kinds. Some of them uh, were 120 uh, electrical volts. Some of them were 220 electrical, or, I mean 110 and 220. So uh, and Daddy understood all of that, and, and he, he, he made those things and kept those machines empowered as they fabricated them and came down the line. There were, you know, 20, 30, 40 people, 50, and 100 people after a while that were doing this thing, and Daddy was doing all the wiring for all of them. And, uh, but he had his, his, his things in order, and he knew where everything was, and, he, and he, man, he kept it hopping. After a while, my mother, who worked in the cotton mill for 25 years, Dad told her, said, come down here and apply. And she did. She got the job. And they put her on the assembly line. There were other women that worked there. And finally, Daddy worked it around so that Mom was in the wire room with him. <laughs> People in that plant would come by on their lunch break or, or any other break they would have. My dad's name was Richard Monroe Davis. They called him Monty. Short for Monroe. And they'd go by and they'd say, Monty, could you help me pray about something? Yeah, yeah, step, come on in here. He'd pray over them. Sometimes he'd anoint them with oil. He wasn't a preacher. But boy, he was a good evangelist, I'll tell you that. He, he lived what he preached. Everybody respected him. Even the owner of the company would come by and say, Monty, would you help me pray about something? Uh, anyway, well, I said all that to, 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 to say this that Daddy understood order. He was a tank gunner in World War II. The Army moves with precision. And they taught Daddy about how to function and all of that. And so Daddy had that in life, but he leaned toward that because he knew God. And somehow, Daddy, without any education, he got his GED when he went in the Army. And, uh, but without any education beyond that, he knew some things because he was close to God. The God of order and design, if, he, if you are close to him, you're going to know something about order and design. And so Daddy knew something about it, and he made it work. And, he, and him and Mama were a team. They were married for 65 years. And they both went home to be with the Lord in victory. Not in defeat, in victory. But I learned a lot of things from my daddy about order. Both daddies. My heavenly one and my earthly one. And in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10 it says... And I'm just going to put this in my vernacular. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy order come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Thy order come. You see, God does not move without preparation. 
God does not move haphazardly. The order of God has to be in place. Listen to what the definition of order is. It's structure. It's building something for God to bless. It's putting something in order for God to touch. It's building a tabernacle for His glory to fill. God could not send His glory until there was a tabernacle for it to dwell in. When God at the very beginning of, of creation and He got the chaos in out of the way and got order put in, then and only then did God make a human. His name was Adam and God deposited a part of Himself in that man. He breathed part of Himself in there. He could not breathe himself into the earth until there was a structure for him to breathe into. And he still will not move unless there is something for him to move through. You hear? Hebrews 10.5 when he cometh into the world, he said, this is Jesus, a body thou hast prepared me. Jesus said that to the Father. A body thou hast prepared me. Why? Because the same thing happened to Jesus that happened to Adam. He was the last Adam. He had to fulfill Everything that was pertaining to Adam. That's part of his assignment. You say, what are you talking about? God breathed his spirit into Adam. At Jesus' 30th birthday, he went to be baptized of John. The heavens opened. The Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove and the Father spoke and said, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. And the Spirit filled him. God breathed into him. A body thou hast prepared me. He, God wouldn't have had anything to breathe into had there not been a little virgin Mary for him to speak his word through her ear gates and that word lodged in her spirit, there would have been no body for God to breathe that anointing into had Jesus not been born. The first Adam and the last Adam both were breathed into by God. Do you see that? Why? Because God moves in order and design. That's the reason the stars are not out there bumping into each other. Because God put them there, calls them all by name, and gave them their movements. The heavens declare the glory of God. Now listen. The structure that God moves through is not religion. It's the Holy Spirit. We need to understand this and we need to go with it because He is the order of God. The Holy Spirit, this is the Spirit's age. The Father had His age. The Son had His age. This is the third dimension, the third person of the Godhead. This is the Spirit's age. And He is the order of the kingdom of God. When He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will do what? Huh? Guide. Guide you into all truth. truth. The structure of the truth. So, Exodus chapter 25, verse 8. God said to Moses, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. That was a divinely ordered structure. God said, build it just meticulously like I tell you to. If it had not been in God's order, he could not have filled it. 
or would not have filled it. When uh, Uzzah touched the Ark of the Covenant, you know the story, <coughs> he was out of order. And when you're out of order and you touch holy things, it won't help you, it'll hurt you. Touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. Don't touch something you don't have the power to touch or the authority or permission to touch. Order. The order, get your house in order. Second Chronicle, chapter 5, verse 14. Then the house of the Lord was filled with the clouds so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house. What happened? You remember that movie? Build a dream, build it, and he will come. Mm -hmm. Build it, and he will come. I don't know who wrote that. I know Kevin Costner played in it. I don't know if anybody even understood anything. I believe God was in the in the message of that. wasn't about the cornfield. wasn't about baseball. It was about a principle. Build it, and he will come. I've heard people misquote that. Build it, and they will come. It's not what he said. Build it, and he will come. See, we spend a lot of time trying to get our ministries filled up with people. If we'd spend the same amount of energy trying to get it filled up with God, the people would come. Now, here's the thing. They built the temple based on the tabernacle. The tabernacle was by minute details. Why? Why? Because it's patterned after what exists in heaven. Your Bible says so. Read the book of Hebrews. What exists in that temple exists there. It's where God dwells. That's where his throne is. Now listen. When they got it built in detail with all of the things that they were supposed to involve and include in it, with all the numerical dimensions and everything, just like God said, when uh, Solomon got up and prayed the prayer of dedication, the glory cloud, the Shekinah cloud of God's presence came and filled that place up. And look what happened. No flesh could stand up and minister because the Spirit was present to minister. God help us to get ourselves in order so that we can get behind that veil where the Spirit takes over where flesh leaves off and does things that we could never do because we're in the order of God. you got to process there. You don't just wake up and find yourself there. You have to process there. And you do that by steps and by design and by understanding the manual of order. Amen. You cannot violate this and have the Shekinah glory fill your house. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40, let all things be done decently and in order. That was a word from the Apostle Paul by the Holy Spirit to the church at Corinth. But I want to say to you that it goes beyond the church and it goes into nations and kindreds and tongues and peoples and this globe. Let all things be done decently and in order. And when we're out of order, we need... we <laughs> Don't sing the song if you haven't given God something to bless, God bless America. God can't bless this mess. Amen. He ain't going to bless it. He can't. It's out of order. Amen. We need to wait to sing that song till we get some order for God's glory to come and bless. Do 
you see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not mad at you. I know I sound like I'm mad at y'all, but I'm, I'm mad at the devil, all right. Yeah. <laughs> the devil's robbed and stolen from us for centuries. Long, long time. And we have just slept right through a lot of stuff, but it's time to it's time. It's time to wake up. Hezekiah, set your house in order. Set your house in order. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed. Now, now let me tell you something else. God wasn't pronouncing death on Hezekiah. Uh -uh. He wasn't doing that. Hezekiah was sick. He had, I believe, what we would call today a skin cancer. And God knew he was going to die, so he just sent Isaiah over there and said, him, hey, set your house in order, you're going to die. Wasn't a pronouncement of death, wasn't a curse. As a matter of fact, Hezekiah is one of the best kings Israel ever had. And that's what he turned his face to the wall and cried and told the Lord. I've been, I've obeyed you. I've done what you called me to do. I, I've, I've been good. I've done this and done that. And uh, I, 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 you know, I don't think it's, it's good for my life to be cut short, you know. And, and before Isaiah could get out of the palace, God spoke to him and said, turn around and go back. Tell Hezekiah I have stepped in to change. I'm adding 15 years to his life. And what did they do? They took a lump of figs and stuck it on the place that was uh, infected, and he got wet. That was medicine. That was, and 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 God was saying to him, "Get get your house in order. Your house needs to be in order." But it wasn't about the death. It was about the order. You understand what I'm saying? And so God wants our house in order so that he can do some things for us that he can't do as long as we're not in order. Because we can't receive if we don't have the structure to receive it. Does that make sense to you? When that little lady was told by the prophet, she said, there, my creditors are coming to take my sons because I'm in debt. He said, what do you got in your house? She said, I've got a little oil in a cruise. Just a small little bit of oil. He said, go borrow vessels, not a few. She did. He said, now you get your son. You go in your house and shut the door. And you start pouring out of your vessel into these vessels that you borrowed. And she poured and poured and poured. And the oil just kept coming. Where was it coming from? Just kept pouring. When did it stop? She ran out of vessels. Huh? Out of vessels. When she didn't have anything else to pour it in. That ought to tell us something. If she'd have kept bringing vessels, the oil would have kept pouring. There was no limit to the oil. The, the limit was in the structure. <laughs> you got to get the order for God to pour into, for God to bless, for God to multiply. You got to give God something to multiply. Nothing times nothing is still nothing. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Old wine skins have to die. Why? Because they can't hold the new wine. Because the new wine is still breathing. It's still growing. It's still processing. And an old structure will be broken by something that it cannot contain. That's the reason we need to break some old structures, some old wineskins, 
not just in our lives, but in the life of this nation. Those things need to be broken because they cannot handle what God wants to pour out to us. We got to get some fools out of office. some righteous people in office. Yeah. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Divine order. Somebody ought to write a book entitled Divine Order Attracts Divine Power. <laughs> Rank and file under the cloud. You shall camp like this. Judah on the east side, Dan on the west side, all the 12 tribes had their place. Who told them that? God did. And even God put their sign, their insignia, their flag in heaven. And they all camped under their sign in the wilderness. And when they stopped, they camped under it. When they marched, they marched in order of their camp. And when they stopped again, they camped in order. They moved in order. You ever notice the funeral procession? You got, I, I mean, you may not pay attention to it, but as, as a minister, you watch things. They got ways of doing things. And the, the hearse has a place. The family car has a place, the minister has a place, all the attendants have a place, you know, you turn your lights on, you got the little placard that you stick up in your windshield or on your mirror or something, some, you know, they do it, some do it different ways, but it's all about order. They, they make you print up an order.